Welcome to the Madison Miller Podcast. Today is Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020. Today I'm going to talk about the latest sports news related to the coronavirus and optimism around Major League Baseball. How about that? KBO look back on this morning's games, look ahead to tomorrow's, go over the result of the Xfinity race from last night at Bristol, some reruns that will be on TV and were on TV, and my 2015 Top 10 MLB Players and Games. All right, we'll start with the virus. Um, like I said in the top of the show, rare optimism with baseball because all it's been lately has been, let's face it, negativity and how um, nobody, uh, not nobody, but A lot of people don't think we're going to have a season. But people in the media that are very, like, locked in believe we will have a season. Andy Martino of SNY, somebody that I've been very critical of in terms of people in the New York media. But he's gotten some things that are significant right a lot within the last couple of years. And he thinks we're having a season, or he's hearing we're having a season no matter what. And he... Better be right about that because we need baseball. We need sports right now. It's a good distraction. And let's hope that uh, Andy Martino is correct there. Um, And the league is to propose a shorter season um, and it plans to propose a 50 to 60 game season with players getting their full portrayed share of their salaries. The... um, Share of the salaries will um, be good for the players, but they want more games. I think it's ultimately going to be full portrayed shares of salaries, but maybe 80 games rather than 50, 60, or what they proposed of 114 or whatever that number was the other day when that report came out um um yeah so J- uh, Jeff Passan who I think is the best in the business um said it yesterday um and Carl Ravage thinks we're gonna have a season and he's obviously in the know as well so um like I said um I think it's a little bit of rare optimism for baseball, and um, I think that uh, they're going to eventually get a deal done. I I feel better about the possibility of having a baseball season now than I did a week ago, which is good. And the NBA looks like um, it's going to go on with uh, their plan of the 22 teams that I discussed yesterday on the show. Um, they're doing a vote on Thursday and the owners are expected to approve the plan. Um, it's going to be the 16 teams that, um, were initially in the postseason and then some of the teams that were on the bubble and you had six. So it's San Antonio, New Orleans, Portland, the Wizards in the East, um, Sacramento, so that's 20. I think 20 is fine in terms of a good number of teams to go back. Because if they do 22, then you're going to see some bad teams in there that really shouldn't belong, like the Suns or the Chicago Bulls, and none of those two teams, in my opinion, really belong. I like the 20-team thing, and then do like a tune-up sort of thing and or like a qualifying round like how the NHL is doing except do it in like a round robin sort of fashion for those to get those uh, last playoff spots in the west and maybe the final one in the east the last playoff spot in the west and the last final playoff spot in the east like the last maybe two spots in the east even so Brooklyn, Orlando, Washington battling for two spots, and then 
in the West, you have you would have in theory Memphis, New Orleans, San Antonio, Portland, and San Antonio battling for that last spot. So um, that I think is um, a clever idea, and then you'd go to the postseason from there, and then you would have some of those teams fighting, play some of those teams, and like I said, like an exhibition tune-up, and whomever does the best in terms of the fighting teams that I put that, um, who I talked about before, whoever does the best in like those round-robin sort of games gets those two last respective playoff spots or three in the Eastern Conference's case. Or, yeah, two, because I said that um, Orlando and Brooklyn are like right there seven and eight, and then Washington was three back. So the two spots in the East and the last spot in the West, and then you just would go from there. Now I want to go over last night's KBO games and, or I should say this morning's KBO games and look ahead to the games tomorrow morning. SK over NC 8-2. That's a stunning upset. SK is playing a little better. Kai Wum over Hanwha 15-3. Kia over Latte 7-2. Samsung over LG 2-0. And Doosan over KT 11-8. Tomorrow, pretty much the same matchups. Kai Wu and Hanwa, Samsung, LG, Latte, Kia, SKNC, and Doosan, KT. In terms of picks go, um, Kai Wu and Hanwa. Um, Hanwa is just now the worst team. They've supplanted, S- SK supplanted them in the standing. So Hanwa is now the worst team record-wise. So... I really have to go with Kai Woom here. Samsung and LG. Um, Got to go with LG. They're playing very well right now and on the tails of the Dinos for the best record. So I got to go with LG. Latte and Kia. Um, I'm going to go with Latte here in a bounce back spot on the road. Do I feel good about it? No. Kia's playing well right now. But Latte tends to bounce back. Like they lose a couple in a row and they bounce back. I think this is a bounce back spot for Latte. SK and NC, this is a classic bounce back spot for the Dinos. I love them here. I just don't see them losing again. Um, at least uh, tomorrow morning. And then Doosan and KT. I'm going to go with Doosan. They're playing well right now. They're three back of the Dinos. And I think that they're going to go on a little bit of a run here. So give me uh, Doosan there on the road. Now I want to go over the NASCAR Xfinity Series race from last night at Bristol. And your winner was Noah Gragson. Gragson, I thought, had a good race. Um, And he took advantage of a big wreck at the end of the race. It was kind of like the Sprint Cup race from Sunday in a weird way. Like, he just came from second and and passed the leader who um, wound up in in a wreck at the end. Chase Briscoe came in second, Brandon Jones third, Harrison Burton fourth, Matt or Myatt Snyder fifth, Daniel Hemrick, 6th. Brandon Brown, 7th. Jeremy Clements, 8th. Josh Williams, 9th. A.J. Allmendinger, 10th. B.J. McClay, 11th. Vinnie Miller, 12th. Joe Graff, Jr., 13th. Timmy Hill, 14th. Jeffrey Earnhardt, that was my um, prayer pick to win the race, 15th. Ryan Sieg, 16th. Justin Haley, 17th. Justin Allager, 18th. And that's who was in the lead, and Gragson passed. And Allager wound up wrecking. And finishing in a mediocre 18th for him after what was a really good race initially before the wreck for him. 19th, Colby Howard. 12th or 20th, Bailey Curry. Other notables, Tommy Joe Martins, 23rd. Um, Jesse Little, 26th. Um, Ross Chaston, 28th. Um, Ronnie Bassett Jr., 31st. Joe Nemechek, 32nd. Jeff Green, 35th. And finishing in last was Michael Annette, which was obviously 37th place. 
Now I'm going to talk about some of the uh, the reruns that have been on in sports lately on TV. Last night, ESPN re-aired the classic Monday Night Football game from last season between the Seahawks and the 49ers from Levi Stadium when Seattle handed the Niners their first loss of the season in overtime on a game-winning kick as time expired in OT by Jason Myers. This was a fun back-and-forth game. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo was under a lot of pressure in that game to come through. Um, He almost got picked off a couple times on that final drive, but Seattle just couldn't put it, the deal away, and then uh, they eventually drove down the field, and then the rookie kicker that was filling in for Robbie Gold kicked the game-tying field goal. He was about to kick the game-winning field goal, but he missed it. The moment was too big for him. And then Seattle wound up, um, that was really hot potato defense is stepping up in overtime, and then uh, Seattle and uh, Jason Myers kicks the game-winning field goal. They wind up with the win. But that was one of the few losses the 49ers had in the regular season. And the 49ers wound up bouncing back from that and getting the one seed in the NFC as they wound up winning the rematch in Week 17 in what was a classic Sunday night football game. And obviously they made the big stop on fourth down as uh, they wound up getting the one seed and um, Seattle wound up in the five spot playing Philadelphia. On ESPN tonight, um, college basketball classic between Maryland and North Carolina from 1986. So you haven't seen many college basketball games on the big ESPN of late. You've been seeing football on Mondays, baseball on Tuesdays, NBA on Wednesdays, college football on Thursdays, and then the S, the um, ESPN 30 for 30 thing on Friday nights. Um, an interesting uh, double header tomorrow night on ESPN. Um, it actually says Game 6 2015 NBA Finals on here, but that's wrong. Um, they are actually re-airing Games 6 and 7 of the... 2012 Eastern Conference Finals between the Celtics and the Heat. The Heat were up 2-0 against Boston. Boston won three straight, including a Game 5 win at Miami to go up 3-2. Everyone and their brother thought, oh, it's 2010 all over again. Everyone thought that Boston was going to win that Game 6. I mean, I wasn't sure who I thought was going to win that game because I kind of thought that that Celtics team wasn't the Celtics team of old from like 2010 and 2008 and that Miami team um was just better and I just wasn't sure who was going to win I thought it was going to be a close competitive game I mean LeBron just shot out of his mind in that game um I want to look up the final score of that game From 2012. I think today's the anniversary of that game. And um, that's why they're re-airing it. Let's see. Eastern Conference. 2012. And by the way, maybe in a few weeks. um, I'll do my countdown for top games of 2012. And maybe um, some games from the series will be in there. So... Game number six in that series, the anniversary of it is going to be on Sunday, June 7th. Miami won 98-79, to so Miami blew him out. LeBron had 45 points, 15 boards, and 5 assists to help Miami force a game seven. And then they are re-airing game seven after that, in which tonight, or tomorrow night, my bad, in which Miami won 101 to 88. That game, the game seven was closer than the game six. And Boston, by the way, led at halftime in game seven. They bounced back and had a good first half in Miami. And in Miami had a great second half and pulled away. That 101 88 score probably was a little bit of an anomaly because of how well Boston played in the first half in game seven. 
But that's a memorable series because, let's face it, that was the end of an era in Boston. Although that next year, um, people thought that they were the second best team in the East, third best team in the East. I thought going into that season that the Celtics were going to be the second best team in the East the year after they took Miami to seven. But it proved that it was the end of an era because Rajon Rondo got hurt. Um, a lot of those guys weren't playing on the back of their basketball cards either. Like they started to look um, like they were on the back ends more and more that season. And then they wound up losing to the Knicks in six games in 2013 without Rajon Rondo. And they arguably should have been swept by the Knicks because they were blowing the Knicks out in game four. And then the Knicks came back and took the lead. And then... Um, forced overtime they took the lead at one point in the fourth quarter and then Boston wound up tying it goes to overtime and then Jeff Green hit a big three pointer with less than a minute to go in overtime if I'm not mistaken to force the game five and then Boston wound up winning game five at Madison Square Garden forcing a game six and then there's the case that the series should have gone seven because the Knicks were blowing Boston out in game six, and then Boston came all the way back and got within single digits, and then Carmelo Anthony wound up getting hot at the end of the game and um, putting it away for the Knicks as uh, uh, the Knicks wound up advancing over the Celtics. But yeah, that in 2012 was truly the last chance that Boston Celtics team had at going to the finals. And that's why it's so memorable because had Boston won that game, I don't know if they would, they probably would have lost to Oklahoma City. Although that series would have been interesting with some plots because Kendra Perkins was on OKC, Jeff Green was on the Celtics. Well, I don't think Jeff Green actually played that year in 2012. I think that was when he had his uh, surgery, so he sat out that season, if I'm not mistaken. But there would have been a lot of storylines if that was the finals in 2012. So, yeah, a lot of big. Uh, fork in the road games for both um franchises here in the Heat and the Celtics and especially for LeBron James. Now I'm going to do my 2015 top 10 MLB players. A lot of honorable mentions cuz there was a lot of players that had great years that year. My honorable mention, Sonny Gray, Oakland Athletics, or formerly of, he had a great year, finished third in the Cy Young. Chris Sale, Chicago White Sox, had a great start to the season, kind of fell apart. Typical Chris Sale, by the way. That's technically what he does all the time. Great start, and then he uh, he kind of falls apart and becomes a little uh, human, to be kind. Um, Joey Votto, Cincinnati Reds. The Reds weren't a good team that year, but Joey Votto had a great year. Andrew McCutcheon, Pittsburgh Pirates, helped lead the Pirates to the wild card game. Jose Altuve, Houston Astros. That was before everybody uh, um, turned on the Astros because obviously this was two years before the cheating and um, there's conspiracy theorists out there that said they cheated that year too, but we really don't know that. Um, but possibly. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he led the league in uh, hitting that year and then helped lead the Astros to a wild-card berth and a wild-card win over the Yankees and wound up almost beating the Royals in the division series that year. They had a 2-1 series lead. They had the lead in Game 4, and then the Royals came back and won that game. That game is in my uh, countdown list, but we'll talk about that later. Um... Manny Machado, Baltimore Orioles. Um, this was truly his breakout season. He was an MVP candidate. Um, I was always a high on Manny Machado. And there was always these debates, Manny Machado or Josh Donaldson, with these two, at the time, AL East third basemen. And I was always on the side of Manny Machado because um, he was homegrown. And I liked Josh Donaldson. I'm still a big fan of Josh Donaldson. But I always, for some reason, I just loved Manny Machado so much more. But um, as of right now, if you ask me who's a better player, it's up for debate. I mean, a year ago, two years ago, we'd say easily Manny Machado because Josh Donaldson had some injury issues and whatnot. And then this past year, he had a bounce back year at the Braves. Um, 
Ioannis Cespedes, um, you should, you could make a case he should have been in the top 10. He helped lead the Mets to the World Series that year after being traded from the Tigers. And Zach Granke, Los Angeles Dodgers, was in the mix for a Cy Young that year. And now my top 10. Number 10 is David Price. He was traded midseason from the Tigers to the Blue Jays, helped um, the Blue Jays win the American League East title. Um, you could argue if he wasn't traded to Toronto, then the Blue Jays wouldn't have won the AL East. I certainly believe that. Um, he was the difference in the Blue Jays making the AL East, but some people would say um, uh, that's not true because that Yankees team wasn't all that special. That's true. That Yankees team wasn't all that special, but um, those AL East teams that were like on the fringe, like Toronto and in Baltimore at the time, were like a piece away from leapfrogging the Yankees. And Toronto went out and got David Price, and he was the piece. I mean, people looked at Troy Tulowitzki as the piece too, but um, I strongly felt that the Blue Jays needed pitching more than offense at the time, and. Sure enough, they went out and acquired David Price. So um, that really helped them get over the top. Ninth, Anthony Rizzo, Chicago Cubs. Um, he was a huge part of the resurgence of the Cubs. He was their best player that year. And he really put it all together that year in Joe Madden's first season to help lead the Cubs to the uh, NLCS. Eight, Paul Goldschmidt, Arizona Diamondbacks. Yes, he was on the Diamondbacks at the time. That's crazy to think about that. Um, he really, um, this is when people started to realize that Paul Goldschmidt was a superstar player. I always thought he was underrated, but this was the year like people start, he was be making people turn heads and say, hey, this guy's awesome. Seven, Dallas Keuchel, Houston Astros. The American League Cy Young Award winner. Um, the best pitcher in the American League at that year. Obviously him and David Price. And he helped lead the Astros to the postseason. Six, Clayton Kershaw, Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, Kershaw was sensational that season. And quite frankly, he doesn't get the credit he deserves for having that great of a season last year. People keep thinking that he was on the mound for that Game 5 loss that eliminated them from the Mets, but no, that was Zach Greinke. But Greinke pitched well in that game, but just DeGrom was better. And I think that um, Kershaw got too much blame that season. Like, he gets too much blame almost every year. But, um, yeah, Kershaw did have a phenomenal year. Came very close to winning the Cy Young. Fifth, Jake Arrieta, Chicago Cubs. He was the Cy Young Award winner in 2015. He got red hot in the second half of the season and helped lead the Cubs to that wild card game. He, he was so good in that wild card game against Garrett Cole and the Pirates. And then, obviously, um, they upset the Cardinals. And I think I picked them to upset the Cardinals, too, if I'm not mistaken. I think I did pick the Cubs in that series. I think I... Before the postseason, I picked the Cubs to actually win the World Series because of how well they were playing, but I was wrong. They got swept by the Mets. And then, um, but yeah, Arietta was just awesome that season. And he had a good 2014 season too, but um, he just took an even bigger leap than people expected, and he wound up winning the Cy Young Award. For Lorenzo Kane, Kansas City Royals, he was probably the best position player on that Royals team that wound up winning the World Series in 2015. Um, that was really good that they uh, bounced back from the Madison Bumgarner train in, in Game 7 in 2014 to uh, win in 2015. That seemed like a, th a theme in this past decade. Like The Spurs rebounded from the bad loss and the Ray Allen shot and won the next year. The Royals bounced back from the Madison Bumgarner um, train and then they rebound the next year and win. Virginia in college basketball loses to uh, UMBC as the, as uh, they lost as a one to a sixteen and then they bounce back and win the title the next year. Um, Alabama after um, that heartbreaking loss to Clemson in the uh, title game when Deshaun Watson led Clemson to that title. 
they bounced back the next year and won. So, like, that was a, a big trend that decade, and the Royals were a part of that. And three, Mike Trout, Los Angeles Angels, obviously the best player in baseball. He was close to winning MVP that year, but no cigar. Second, Josh Donaldson, Toronto Blue Jays. I talked about it a little earlier when I was talking about Manny Machado. Josh Donaldson, that previous offseason, was traded from Oakland to Toronto and really helped change the dynamic of that Blue Jays team. And he had over 40 home runs, and he was just awesome that year and obviously had good protection in that lineup as well. Number one, Bryce Harper, Washington Nationals. Um, This was a controversial decision by my part of putting a player whose team didn't even make the postseason number one. But he was the best player in baseball in 2015. Many people thought he was going to be a better baseball player than Mike Trout. And that's obviously not the case. Um, People look at Bryce Harper not as a bust, obviously, but as an underachiever. It is because of all the hype he got, being the number one overall pick, and then only having that great season in 2015. And I felt that way about Steven Strasburg as somebody that never really lived up to the hype, but he finally has lived up to the hype the the past couple of years and was a big part of the Nationals winning the World Series this past season. So, yeah, Bryce Harper is my choice for my number one player in 2015. Now I'm going to do my 2015 Top 10 MLB games. No honorable mentions, just a straight countdown. 10th place, Yankees, Blue Jays, August 7th. Um, the Yankees were a team that season was going in the wrong direction. The Blue Jays had just gotten David Price. David Price pitched in that game. Blue Jays get out to a 3 nothing lead. Yankees come from behind and win the game. Big pinch hit home run by Carlos Beltran off of, if I'm not mistaken, Aaron Sanchez, that reliever who's no longer on the Blue Jays. He's on Houston now. And then the Yankees wound up prevailing for a 4-3 win. If I'm not mistaken, the Yankees were like 2-1 to one underdogs in that game. Ninth, Royals-Astros 2015 ALDS Game 4. I spoke about this game a little bit earlier and how the Astros had a 2-1 lead in that series and it had the lead in the possible closeout clincher Game 4 and the Royals came from behind the win. Eighth place, Mets-Dodgers 2015 NLDS Game 5. Jacob deGrom dominates and... Zach Greinke pitches well, but this game is obviously remembered for the uh, Chase Utley, Ruben Tejada debacle as well. But that was just a great baseball game. Sands that moment, and the Mets wound up uh, clinching the uh, berth in the NLCS to play the Cubs. Seventh, Rockies-Cubs, July 27th. 8-7 Cubs win on a walk-off home run by Chris Bryant. And that was obviously a player I left off the list. He's certainly an honorable mention as well, but I just forgot to include him. He had a great rookie year. He literally had a breakout year in his rookie year and really um, made a name for himself as a superstar in the game. Sixth place Rays Yankees, July 3rd. It was the eve of the 4th of July. It was past midnight, extra inning game. I believe it was the... I want to say it was like the 11th or 12th inning. It could have been the 10th inning. Um, Rays take a 5-4 lead in the top of the inning and in the bottom of the inning. Walk off three-run home run by Brian McCann as the Yankees came away with a 7-5 victory to maintain their then lead in the American League East. Fifth place, Nationals-Mets, July 31st. Walk off home run by Wilmer Flores. In a 2-1 to one Mets win. And th- that game really was the start of a magical run f- to the, for the Mets in winning the division title and ultimately representing the National League in the World Series. Fourth place, Rangers-Blue Jays 2015 ALDS Game 5. This was a memorable game. Um, decisive Game 5 in Toronto. Um, obviously, there was a bad call that... Um, pretty much um, changed the outlook of that game at the time we thought that. And then later on in the game, I believe it was in the bottom of the seventh, Jose Bautista 
hits a go ahead three run home run to break a 3 3 tie. And then there's debris flying everywhere, which I thought was wrong of the Toronto fans to do. But that, overall, that was a great game and a memorable game, to say the least. Third place, Blue Jays Royals, 2015 NLC or ALCS Game 6. Um, this was a game that also had a bad call or f- a few bad calls in it. And then in the bottom of the eighth inning, the Royals take the lead. And then the closer comes out. And then off to the World Series they go. Second place, Mets Royals, 2015 World Series, Game 1. Mets have the lead. Um, Horace's Familia is out. And he had a bad World Series. There was no other way to put around it. Terry Collins overused him in that run to the postseason, obviously. But he blows the save. Royals wind up coming behind the win. And at number 1, Royals-Mets, 2015 World Series, Game 5. Matt Harvey pitches a brilliant game. Terry Collins... Um, I believe keeps him in for a batter and then he walks somebody then he goes to Familia Familia blows it and then the Royals bounce all over Familia and they wind up closing the deal and winning the World Series breaking the long drought they had had and that's it for the podcast today I'll be back tomorrow with another show talking about the latest sports news related to COVID and when sports can come back We'll also go over the KBO scores. We will do a mock draft for Major League Baseball. And maybe I'll have some other activities on the show for you guys as well. And also tomorrow I'm going to have two guests on my podcast. I'm going to have on Jane Celestin. And I'm going to have on Julian Gilardi. Two separate shows as we're going to talk about um, the Madison's Bracket of Pain. As, like I said on the show the other day, each guest I'm going to have on for this is getting a region. Um, The region I'm giving the James to analyze with me is the painful region. And the region I'm going to give Julian to look at with me is going to be either the unlucky region or the heartbreak region, depending on what I choose. And then Jeff Maglachetti is going to be the uh, what-if region. And then, obviously, whatever um, uh, Julian doesn't get will be the region Derek will get to analyze with me. Hope you guys have a great day, everybody.